We're less than one week away from the start of a new session of Congress. Republicans are taking the majority by a very narrow margin, and the divide between the two parties is already taking hold, especially over key issues like funding for the war in Ukraine and an ethics scandal over the lawmaker who has not even been sworn in yet, Congressman-elect George Santos, as we've been discussing. Joining me now, Democratic Congressman from Massachusetts, Jake Auchincloss. He is vice chair of the Financial Services Committee, a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, as as well as a Marine veteran. Nice to see you, Congressman. Thank you so much for joining me yep. here in this holiday week. So Congress was able to avoid a government shutdown, as you know, before the new year by passing that funding bill. It was one of the key issues uh, of the $45 million in aid for Ukraine. So drawing on your experience as a Marine veteran, what is your message to your colleagues across the aisle who have questioned the need for U.S. aid in this conflict? And are you concerned about additional funding for Ukraine when Republicans take control of the House? I am. Uh, good to be with you, Alex. Uh, my message to the House GOP is don't just stand up for Ukraine when you're applauding President Zelensky in his address to Congress. Stand up for Ukraine with your vote. Ukraine is fighting on the front lines of the free world. And our investments in Ukraine's security and economy are not just about the right thing to do. They're not just about upholding the post-war rules-based order that has done so much to spread peace and prosperity the world over. It is also a terrific national security investment. With about 7 to 8% of our annual Pentagon budget, we have cratered roughly 50% of Russia's conventional military force. We've doubled the border of NATO once Finland uh, and its neighbor joins. We have induced Germany and Japan to increase their domestic defense spending. America, Ukraine, we are stronger now uh, than we were on February 24th. And the House GOP, as with so much else, now has the initiative with the gavel on whether they want to continue to support freedom and democracy against authoritarianism, uh, or whether they want to continue to choose an autocratic vision of the world as they have with their support of Donald Trump for the last two terms. Can I ask you quickly how effective was President Zelensky's address to Congress, how much that might have uh, swayed anyone on the fence about support for Ukraine? I think he was extremely effective. The moment when he handed the Ukrainian flag to Vice President Harris and Speaker Pelosi was deeply meaningful to me. I went over and, and crossed the aisle and talked to some of my colleagues in the conservative wing of the GOP. And I, I do worry that the pull of their base is stronger even than President Zelensky's inspiring rhetoric. I hear that they may be willing to support military aid, but not economic aid. But those two things are integrated and mutually reinforcing. we got to provide both. Uh, yeah. And of course, we need to audit where those funds are going. That's just good governance. We've been doing that. We need to continue to do that. Happy to work with the GOP on ways to strengthen uh, that process. But just using it as an excuse to give Vladimir Putin a second lease on life is not acceptable foreign policy. So the point you're making right there brings me to our next question about Republicans being beholden to their base. Congress is more divided than ever and it reflects the political climate of our country. How will you work effectively with your colleagues across the aisle? And what are the issues that you're going to focus on in 2023? Well, the House GOP is in disarray right now. A lot's going to change between now and January 3rd and certainly thereafter. But here's what hasn't changed. What hasn't changed is that going into the fourth term in a row, the House GOP has a choice between what's best for Donald Trump or what's best for America. And if they choose what's best for America, if they want to work on achieving energy independence, on lowering health care costs, looking forward to working with them on it. We just finished one of the most productive bipartisan Congresses. Yes, bipartisan Congresses since the Great Society. Got a lot done with Republican votes, infrastructure, investments in science, investments in technology and semiconductors, support for Ukraine, gun safety legislation. And the House GOP can continue that momentum. They can get up every day and work to deliver results. Uh, I've got a district that has some of the bluest zip codes in the country, as well as the reddest county in Massachusetts. And over the, the last two years, uh, with Democrats in charge of the House, we've been able to deliver things that both Republican mayors and Democratic mayors find useful. Up to the GOP whether they want to continue that style of governance or whether they want to invite Marjorie Taylor Greene to the leadership table and engage in political conspiracy theories and theatrics hmm. designed to embarrass the president. Because if they do that, we're going to fight back ferociously.
So you mentioned Marjorie Taylor Greene. With the House GOP leadership being silent on the many false claims from George Santos on his background, we remember that she was sidelined. She was removed from all of her committees uh, soon after taking the oath of office. Do you think that would be effective with the congressman-elect George Santos? Is that, you think, his fate potentially in the House? Here again, we're seeing the vacuum of strong House GOP leadership. Really, Kevin McCarthy and his lieutenants should handle this situation. George Santos is an embarrassment to the House GOP. He's an embarrassment to Congress. They should pick up the phone and take care of this. They're not willing to. They put politics above uh, integrity. And so Democrats may have to take care of this in 2024, because rest assured, there is going to be a strong challenge to Mr. Santos if he decides to run again. And I can say, as you know, one of the few Jewish members of Congress, I find his use of Judaism particularly offensive. Judaism, especially at a time of heightened anti-Semitism, is not political currency. It is a millennial old tradition, and he owes an apology to the entire Jewish community. I agree with you there, and on many other points as well. Democratic Congressman from Massachusetts, Jake Auchincloss, thank you so much for your time, sir. Meantime,